So we're in Revelation chapter 22, the last of the series of Revelation. The title is called The River of Life. As Mike was sharing, uh, we received the Holy Spirit as a down payment to our inheritance, which will be in totality once we get to heaven. So in this chapter, we're going to see the totality of what we have a taste of now. We just have a taste. A down payment is not the fullness of it. It's the Holy Spirit that guides us and leads us into all truth. And so in this first verse, you're going to see the Trinity. You're going to see the Father. You're going to see the Lamb of God. And you're going to see the water of life flowing from the throne of God. That's the Trinity. The water flowing from the Lamb of God, from the throne of God, I should say, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So let's read verses 1 through 5, chapter 22. Then he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming down from the throne of God and the Lamb in the middle of the street. And on either side of the river there was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him, and they will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun. Why? Because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. <coughs> so let's unpack this. Let's start with verse 1. And then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So there you have the Trinity, the water of life is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because other scriptures have told us that. One scripture is John 7, uh, beginning with 37. Jesus said, uh, come to me all you who are thirsty. And from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus didn't die yet. He didn't send the Holy Spirit yet at the day of Pentecost. But he was saying, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so here we just read in Revelation that he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming down the center of the street. You know, remember when Jesus approached the, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, she came somewhere about noontime, it tells us, which is really not supposed to happen then in the heat of the day. But because she was living with a man and she had five husbands before that, she was probably looked at as a, uh, a disgrace. So normally the women would come out early in the morning before the sun rose up or late at night in the cool of the night. But she came at the sixth hour, which was about noontime. And it was there that Jesus talked to her, and, she said, and he said, give me a, a drink of water. And she says, how can I give you a drink? you got nothing to draw. He said, if you would have asked me for a drink, I would have given you living water. And she said, give me some of that. And this is what he said. Jesus answered and said that everyone who drinks of, the water will, of this water will thirst again at the well of Jacob. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Speaking about the Holy Spirit, you know, you don't have an actual well of water bubbling up inside of you. But the bubble, the living water is a picture of water bubbling up, you know, from a well, from the springs of life. So the symbolism of this water of life, not water of whatever, salt, but water of life coming from the throne of God, flowing down the middle of the street. And on each side of this street, think of a street and water coming down the middle of the street, and you've got two sidewalks. And on each sidewalk, there is the tree of life. So let's go. Let's read the next verse. <clears throat> so that river was in the middle, the center of the street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So here you see a couple of things. Number one, 
you see it coming down the middle and the tree of life. The tree of life was first spoken of in the Garden of Eden. The Lord God told Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of that tree, you will die. And they ate of it and they died. Well, how did they die? Not only physically many years later, but spiritually they were disconnected from God. That's our life. When you're disconnected from God, you have no life in yourself. And I don't have any life. It's when we stay connected, we have life. So here was uh, the tree of life was seen again in heaven. And the reason why they didn't eat from the tree of life in the garden, though they could have, they decided to disobey and eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So in application for us, if the Spirit of God is the center of our lives, running down the middle, on both sides, wherever you are, you're going to produce fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Can I get an amen? amen? But he has to be in the middle, in the center. And so it says that the fruit <clears throat> would appear in heaven. He's giving a picture here of the abundance. There would be 12 varieties, 12 different kinds. Who ever heard of a, an apple tree having oranges and bananas on it and apricots? No, it only has one fruit. But in this particular place, he's giving us a picture that there's going to be such a diversity when you're in heaven. Uh, will we have to eat? Yeah, maybe we will. I don't think we'll have to, but I believe it'll be part of it. Remember Jesus when he appeared after the resurrection? Uh, he just popped in, and then when he met them on the seashore, he said, hey, you got any fish? So he, he could eat. He had a physical body. So our immortal bodies is going to be so far gone, it's so unrecognizable as it is now, but it's going to be so beautiful. So it says here that there were 12 different kinds of fruit every month. <clears throat> and I would like to give this to you. In Psalm chapter 1, think about this for a minute, because when you have the Holy Spirit and you're obedient to the word of God, you're going to bear fruit if he's the center of your life. He said in Psalm 1, 1 to 3, blessed, how blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Notice the, the progression. First, you're walking with sinners, you know, you're yapping... And then before you know it, you're standing still and you're receiving more of the, of the baloney. And then the next step is you're sitting down with them and you're counseling with them. So he said, blessed is the man who doesn't walk, stand, or sit in the counsel of the wicked. And then he goes on to say, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates on it day and night. The word of God is the law of God. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Notice it says that even the leaves in heaven will be for the healing of the nations. There's no waste in God. When you bear fruit and you have other things, God uses those other things. There's no waste. Remember when Jesus fed the multitude, right? 5,000 of them. He said, now go and collect all the scraps. There was no waste. What he did with it, I don't know. But I'm sure he probably gave it to other people. But there's never a waste when you're following God. Romans 8, 28, he causes all things to work together for good to them that love him and called according to his purposes. So the fruit that you will bear and I will bear are what? Fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 tells us. I believe it's Galatians 5. Yeah, 5.22. Fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Nine fruits. But in heaven, there's going to be 12 different kinds of fruit. It's going to be abundance. But I want more love. I want more joy. I want more peace. I want more faithfulness, gentleness. I want more self-control in my life. How many want more of that in their life? I think we all do, especially if you're driving. You want more self-control. Can I get an amen? I know most men do, but women, they have their place too. Come on. I, you, you can see that too. So these fruits come in season, in seasons. So don't think, well, you know, I'll never, it'll happen. Just stay faithful to the Lord and you will start changing from the inside out. It's like if you go to bodybuilding. 
You know, you, you've seen the comic books. Or if they don't have comic books today, I don't know what they have. But back in the day, they had the before and after. And, you know, they had this guy on the beach, a skinny, skinny little dude, and someone kicks sand in his face, and then it shows you him drinking protein or something, and now he's a hulk, you know? <laughs> Don't let someone kick sand in your face, you know? And bodybuilding takes time. You just don't go there one week and expect to have strength or muscles, but week after week, you stay consistent, and what happens? You look like me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> No. Week after week, you start getting stronger and stronger and stronger. That's just how it works. And you start seeing results. Stay in the spirit, brothers and sisters, and you will bear fruit. Guaranteed. So continuing on, it tells us in verse 3, And there will no longer be any curse. The curse brought death, pain, sorrow, deformity. You know, you just see it all over. That was the curse that came upon man when he disobeyed God, he was separated. But Jesus became a curse for us. So we don't have to live under that condemnation. Say amen if you're with me. So there will no longer be any curse. Remember, we got a taste of it now. But in heaven, it will be the full fulfillment of it. There will be, uh, and the throne of God, no longer a curse. And the throne of God and the lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve him. Now, what is a bond servant? Paul... James, uh, Jude, Peter, many of those books, when you read them, it begins, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, an apostle, Romans 1.1. What is a bondservant? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, a bondservant would be this. He'd be serving his master for close to seven years, and on the seventh year, he would be set free. And the bondservant who was set free would say, no, I love my master. I willingly want to stay and serve him for the rest of my life. Why? Because that household and his master was so good and so kind. So now it was an act of his choice, a willing, a willingness. So in heaven, as a bond servant, we're bond servants now. And sometimes when you think of that word, oh, I'm going to serve God, you know, I'm going to... And you get this idea of being a slave or something. But that, that's not true. You will be serving God out of the greatness of his love, out of the greatness of his goodness. It will not be hard to serve. You will not have two natures. On earth, the spirit wars against the flesh, and the flesh does not want to serve God. Can I get an amen? And that's the battle. However, the spirit gives us the ability and the power to put to death the deeds of the flesh. But a a bondservant is someone who willingly chooses to continue to serve God. Now, here's what Jesus said in John 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Okay, there's a a connection. He's not the friend of everybody. You want to know that. He loves everybody, but not everyone has that intimate relationship unless you're born again. And then you have the Holy Spirit. But he loves everybody. So it says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves. For the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. He calls me a friend. Not only that, but Galatians says he now calls us a son. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Isn't that what... Mike was speaking about this morning. We're heirs of God. Do you see how the Holy Spirit synchronizes everything together? The singing, the songs. You don't even know it, but God already knows what what he's putting together. You just got to yield and just say, Lord, I look to serve you. So we see here that you've been set free. You have been called God's bondservant, but a bondservant is someone who chooses too. Galatians also tells us you've been called to freedom, brethren. Listen, but only do not you, but only don't give your flesh an opportunity, but rather serve one another in love. You've been called to freedom, brethren. Only do not give your flesh an opportunity, but serve each other in love. So the freedom that you have as his son and as his daughter. A lot of people, well, you know, I believe in Christ. I'm free in Christ. Let me go and do what I want. No, you don't know the depth of God's love for you when you want to move there. 
Why get married if you want to go out and fornicate? Am I right or wrong? Why get married if you want to go out and cheat? If you want to get married, you get married because you want to stay faithful to that one person that God has given you. So here we see the Lord is, is giving us the fruits of the Spirit. There's going to be a bond servant serving the Lord. And not only that, but in the next verse, it tells us that we will see his face. In verse 4. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. So the, symbol, the symbolism of his name on your forehead is ownership. You will belong to him. Entirely his. But to see his face. His face, you're not going to see, you know, Jesus with a beard and maybe long hair and a robe. You know, is that going to be his face? No. His face is the essence of who he is. Now listen to this. Moses, when you go with me to Exodus 33, turn with me to Exodus chapter 33 in the beginning of the Bible, starting with verse 18. Moses wanted to see the glory of God, the face of God. And God said, no man can see my face lest he die. No man could see God's face unless he died. So in heaven here, he's saying, we'll see his face because we won't be in our mortal bodies. We'll be in our supernatural glorified bodies to be able to take the voltage. You see? You have a weak wire and you get a, a million pounds of voltage coming through that weak wire. It's going to burn up. So you've got to have a glorified body, an immortal body, a body like Christ in order to see Christ as he is. So Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And God said, no man can see my face and live. So what did he do? He put him in the cleft of a rock and he put his hand over him and said, he said, Moses, you're not going to see my face. You're going to see my hind parts. You're going to see me passing you by. And I'm going to give you a glimpse of that. And you know what he saw when he saw the glory of God? You would think, well, let me see your glory. You would think, bam, he would open up the heavens and show the, his creation and show the armies in heaven, all of his angels, all of his wealth. But that wasn't his glory. His glory was his love and kindness. His glory was his goodness and his grace. So he was telling Moses, you can't even see my goodness. God is so pure, holy, loving. You can't contain that. We get a little glimpse of it. But in heaven, if you don't have a glorified body, you'll explode. So Moses... In Exodus uh, 34, verse 5 and 7. No, Exodus 33, I'm sorry. Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, that is God, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. So his glory is his goodness. And you will proclaim, and, and will proclaim, he will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Verse 20 said, but he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So, you know, it's like when a jet passes by, you see the smoke behind it. You don't see the, you know, actual jet. You can look up in the sky sometimes, you see the writing in the sky or whatever it is. You say, wow, you know, where does that come from? That comes from the heat and the condensation, and it's, it's, it's steam from a jet passing by that's up, you know, a thousand miles. I don't know how high it is. But he's saying here, you'll see my glory as I pass. You'll see, you'll see the steam of me. You're not going to see my face. And so you'll see my back and not my face. And then we read in 34, 5 and 7, and the Lord... Descended in the cloud, after he promised Moses, you'll, you'll see my hind parts, my goodness. And he stood there with him in the cloud as he called upon the name of the Lord. Moses called. 
And then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, here's his glory. The Lord, the Lord God, is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He's just. Visiting the iniquity on the fathers and on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Meaning when that cycle is not broken, your father's sins are going to be imparted to your children. If you're an alcoholic, more than likely your children can be an alcoholic. If you're a woman abuser or a wife beater, more than likely your children are going to grow up. They learn by example. Can I get an amen? On the other hand, if your father is a holy man, a godly man, guess what? Your children are going to learn too. Isn't that true? So he was saying here, when Moses said, let me see your glory, God said, no one can see my glory and live, but you'll see my hind parts passing you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. Now, we've heard the story, or we've read through the scripture. Jesus is the rock. Can I get an amen? He's the rock of my salvation. Philip said, Father, he said, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So if you want to see God, Look at Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of God. Hebrews chapter 1. God in the flesh. Can I get an amen? So people, I want to see God. He's here. Emmanuel, God with us. And the word dwelt, tabernacled among us. In the beginning was the word. So hallelujah. Jesus is the exact representation of God the Father. He is the rock of our salvation. Can I get an amen? It's kind of weak. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yes, I love it. Thank you. So, what really stood out to me is, I would think, if you would talk to a man, and you would say, hey, show me your glory, he surely wouldn't say, hey, you're looking at it. He would show you all of his riches, all of the kingdoms that he has conquered. He would show you his vast army, This is my glory. But when it was asked, and God said, I will show you my glory, he said, this is what I'll proclaim. God is gracious. God is compassionate. God is merciful. God is gentle. Isn't that sweet? I mean, the other way, it would scare me. You know, to see this God, this creator who made this universe, the sun, you can fill a million, hear me, a million earths inside the sun if you just hollowed it out. Is that big or is that big? And then you have other suns or stars where you could fit a million of those suns that we have into the side of them. Oh, that would scare me if God showed me his power like that. But he doesn't. He said, this is my glory. His glory is to dwell with us. What kind of God would do that? But a loving God who said, I want these human beings to be with me forever, to experience all of my goodness, my love, my kindness, my omniscience, my body, my glorified body. Whoa. Whoa, boy. Do you want to go there? Amen. That's where I want to be, because I know we're all on a time share here, you know. When your time is up and your share is up, beep, you're gone. But you want to be ready when you meet the Lord. So, that was his goodness. So, will we see his face then? That's what the word tells us, what I just read. We will see his face, his goodness, his kindness, his love, everything about him, because you'll have the capacity with an immortal, glorified body, just like his that can take the surge of that enormous goodness of God. We just have a taste right now. The Holy Spirit gives you a taste of the fruits of the Spirit. You just have a taste. We love his unconditional love. (laughs) I'll tell you, that's how we live today, by his goodness. Can I get an amen? One more thought on that. It says, the kindness of the Lord, the kindness of God leads you to repentance. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. He is kind, gentle, long-suffering. If he didn't, if God didn't have long-suffering for my life, and I could say for your life too, Where would we be? You know, I give up on people way before God does. 
God says, no, no, you know, I'm patient. That's why he didn't come back yet. He's patient with all of us. He's patient with your loved ones. He wants all to come to repentance. So where are we? We're in verse 5. Yeah, we're running out of time. And there will be no longer any night, and they will not have need of the light of the lamp, nor of the light of the sun. Why is that? Because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever. That stuck out to me. You're not going to need the light of a sun because the Lord God's glory will illuminate you. The brightness of God's love and goodness will be shining through you and you won't need a sun to direct. You'll be walking in the light of God that's in you. Do you see that? That's a beautiful thing. It's not going to need of a sun or a moon or, or even God's glory, which is going to brighten up everything, but his glory will be in you. Why is that? Hello? Because know ye not that you are the temple of God now and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you now? You have the light of God now. You have a taste of it. And you walk in that light and people see that light. And they say, wow, I want what you have. What do you have? Hey, it has nothing to do with me. It's God. I gave my life to Jesus and it's his light in me that's emanating, that's illuminating through me. It's a taste in heaven. It's going to be fullness. But right now, so we have to say to ourselves, if I'm the temple of God now and the Holy Spirit dwells in me, I need to make sure that his light is shining. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He said, you don't put a light under a bushel, you put it on a hill so that all can see it. Can I get an amen? amen? So the light that you have is Jesus Christ. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Step out in faith and show that light to anyone who, who you come near. And they might run or they might be drawn. But that's God's business. Can I get an amen? amen. <coughs> so there'll be no need of any other light but the glory of God will be our light in us, shining through us, and his glory will light up the whole place that we'll be staying in, in this place called heaven. So we will reign with him forever and ever. We're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp. Trust me. You're going to be reigning. He's going to... Oh, like how he made this world and people and how everything is synchronized. It rains, the it waters, the seed grows. I mean, this cannot be evolution. This cannot be by accident. God, the master genius, put this all together in detail. And if he did that, what is heaven going to be like? You're not going to be, okay, God, what next? He, he's endless. His knowledge will be endless. We will be forever loving each other. Amen. We'll be ever, be ever, we'll be forever with Jesus Christ. And we will reign with him. Whatever that entails. I don't know. Personally, I don't care. As long as I'm with him. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, <clears throat> and it says this in verse uh, 6 through 9. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But the angel said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets and those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Don't worship an angel. There is angel worshiping, you know. People wor Don't worship saints. A saint is, is an ain't. They are not someone who is omniscient and they hear your prayers, whatever they may be, Saint Jude or Saint whatever. And don't worship Mary. Mary is a person, a sinner, who was saved by God's grace. She wasn't born without sin. She died. If she never died, and that's part of the, the, the theology of Catholicism, she was uh, uh, taken up to heaven without dying. No. There's no record. There's nothing of that. She called Jesus her Savior as well as her son. And I'm not putting down the sincere people who really love the Lord. But the Bible is really the final authority of who do we worship? There is only one mediator between God and man, 
the man Christ Jesus. There's only one person, not a priest, not, not a, a pastor. He doesn't forgive you your sins. Jesus Christ alone. Can I get an amen? amen? And that's beautiful freedom, and that's the word of God, the truth of God that we follow, not tradition, not what someone would tell me. So now we go on to reading verses 10 to 13. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let no one, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who's filthy still be filthy. The one who is righteous still practice righteousness. The one who is holy, keep yourself holy. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So the word Alpha and Omega is the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha is the first letter, like A in our English, and Z, like in our English, is the Omega. The Alpha and Omega, the first and last of the Greek alphabet. So he says, I'm the beginning and the end. There's nothing more. You can't get around me. You can't get in front of me. You can't get behind me. I'm there. I'm the beginning and the end. And he says this, that if you're... I remember hearing this once. It's not what you say that defines you. It's what you do. It's not what you say that defines you. It's what you do. So he was saying here, if you're unrighteous, keep doing it. If you're holy and righteous because of the blood of Jesus, keep doing that. It's what you do that defines you, not what you say. So keep that in mind because that's how the Lord judges things, right? You can get over on the world's judges and stuff like that. You, you know, you blow a lot of smoke. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. And we see that today in government big time. Amen? But we're not going to go there. So it's what you do that defines you. If you're righteous and holy, still practice. Notice the word. Practice righteousness. doesn't say you're going to be perfect. But you're practicing it rather than practicing sin. Why? He said, I'm coming quickly, guys. He said, well, wow, he wrote that 2,000 years ago. That's, this doesn't seem quick to me. Again, Peter says, a day is like a 1,000 years to us. One day, God doesn't measure time like you do when I do. One day to him is like a 1,000 years to us. So someone has once said, so it's been only two days, 2,000 years. Well, maybe this is the third Maybe this is resurrection. Maybe this is the day he comes back and he takes us all home. Oh, come on. That's beautiful. So stay strong in the Lord and keep practicing righteousness and holiness. Let your light shine. You have the Holy Spirit like I do. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. There is no other name given unto man by which we would be saved. Just stand proud with him. Doesn't mean you're perfect. But he is perfect. And he is committed to us. So it goes on in verse 14. And blessed are those. This is how you get to heaven. Blessed are those who wash their robes. So that they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter by the gates into the city. So how do you wash your robe? Is it me doing a lot of different works? Well, I'm going to wash myself clean. I'm going to clean myself. I'm going to promise I'm not going to sin no more. I'm going to take a shower every day or whatever. No, this is how you wash your robe and you're saved. In Revelation 7, verse 14, I said to him, my Lord, John is saying here, uh, you know. And he said to me, because he said, who are all these people in these robes? And he said, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Listen, they have washed their robes and made them white. In the blood of the Lamb. So how do you wash your robe? You wash your robe by accepting Jesus Christ. You wash it by putting yourself under his jurisdiction. Believing that his blood has washed your sins away. So he goes on by saying, Blessed are those who have washed their robes. There's a story. I'm not going to go into the deep details. In Matthew 22, a king was throwing a wedding feast for his son. It's a picture of Jesus and the Father. And he invited all the Jewish people. The Jewish people, ah, we got things to do. Da, 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 we can't come. I got a house. To, I got a, 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 a farm to take care of. I just married someone and I can't come. All excuses. And that's what the world does. That's what people do. I can't come to Jesus now. You know, I got so many things. No, 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 no. 
tomorrow you may meet the Lord. And if you're not ready, boom, you're gone. But he's given you mercy. He's given me mercy to accept him. Even today, even today is not a coincidence. God has called you to accept him today. So it goes on to say that this king invited the Jews and they didn't come. And he said, all right, they don't want to come. Go to the highways and byways. Go to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Invite them in because my house will be filled. And so he, he invited both the good and the evil, it says. And what happened was uh, the king noticed that someone was in there without a righteous robe on. He said, hey, how did you get in here? You don't have a wedding robe on. And he says, cast them out into outer darkness because he wasn't saved, you see? So God invites everybody, but not everybody washes their robe in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're born again, you're clean, you're saved, you're going to heaven. Say amen if you're with me. And if you're not, then this is an opportunity for anyone here who's not sure. Maybe your life wasn't defined by your character, but you say, no, I'm believing in Christ. I'm going to start anew today. Give me the grace, Holy Spirit. Today's your chance. So verse 15, he says this, outside are the dogs, meaning the unsaved, sorcerers, immoral persons, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. Practices lying. <coughs> I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify, testify to you these things for the churches. I'm the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride, that's the Holy Spirit and you, the church, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take of the water of life without cost. Jesus Christ said, he is both the root and the descendant, meaning he is both God, the root. He was before David, and he is the descendant of David. The Messiah had to come from the lineage of David. So he's both the root, he's both God before the descendant of David, and he's also part of the descendant of David. He came through the lineage of David. Isn't that cool? That's Jesus. You know, I mean, he makes it clear that, you know, hey, I'm not just a prophet here. I always was. And, you know, tell him I'm not here right now, okay? He always was and will always be. But he's also the son of man. And he came for you and me. Hoo-hoo. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Now, come and let the one who is thirsty come. We close verse 18 to 21. So I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Listen to this. This, this is God's holy Bible. This is the word of God. This is not made by man. This is, you can't change this. You can't add to it. You can't subtract to it. If you do, you, you're going to be cursed. That's what it says right here. This is God's holy word. I may not understand everything, but that doesn't stop me from believing in Jesus. And I can tell you this. When I don't understand a problem, if I'm taking a test, I move on to the next question. Don't get hung up on the Trinity. How many of you people know the tr what the Trinity I mean, do you really understand the Trinity? I don't think so. Do you really understand eternity? God always was? How did that happen? No, but I accept it because God is bigger than me. His brain is a lot bigger than my little peanut. And he said that he always was and he always will be. But it tells me his word is the word of God. People have been trying to squash it for years. They cannot squash it because God has protected it. Can I get an amen? amen. So it says this, I testify to you and everyone who knows the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which God, uh, which is written in the book. And now he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. The response, come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Wow. We're going to have communion. I know we're running a little over time here, but I believe sometimes God chisels us in our impatience and he works something in us because the word of God is the word of God and we never want to cut that short. Can I get an amen?